I'm going to fire some questions at you, um, and I'd like you to kind of walk us through some of your ideas um, relating to your writings, because uh, um, you don't explicitly talk about visual art per se, but you just talk about how perception works, and artists are people that have to, uh, if they're doing their job properly, rewrite how we perceive the world. So let's start with um, Technica Magic. Maybe I should start with the fact that many years ago I, um, I studied economics. And one of the things that struck me in economics is the structure of balance sheets. It was a, a particular way of structuring balance sheets which was invented during the Renaissance uh, by this person called Luca Pacioli, who was a Franciscan monk but also was other things, mathematician. And in the balance sheet you have a perfect equivalence between what's on one side and what's on the other side. Strangely, when you create a traditional balance, the losses and gains somehow always compose a perfect equilibrium. So when creating the book, I was thinking of um, structuring it in a similar fashion. Half of it was about the system of reality which we use today, I will explain what that means, and half of it was about an alternative system of reality. And I wanted the two to be perfect mirrors of each other. So the architecture is in that way almost like a balance sheet. Technic and magic are two different ways of creating reality, of, making, uh, of creating a world out of the chaos of raw perceptions. Two different ways of ordering. This is simply what they are. Two different paradigms. To elaborate, there are two different ways of deciding when we are, are invested by the avalanche of perceptions, which includes all sorts of things, how we select them. Which perceptions we select as real, which ones we select as unreal, which ones, how we organize them into discrete units in space, in time, and conceptually. Technique has one method, magic has another method. Neither of them is right, neither of them is wrong. They are both arbitrary ways in which we organize our the mental landscape. That's how we provide ourselves with a meaningful landscape where we can live. Technic is, a, um, is a, the name I assign to, this, to one of these methods. Uh, it's a name that I borrowed from many other thinkers as well that have been trying to grapple with the same thing. Um, Heidegger, Junger, Emanuele Severino. And it's the name that I assign to a particular way of making sense of reality, which really came into its own in the 20th century even though it was already there before, came into its own after the First World War, and then very much so after the 70s, and very much in the last 30, 40 years. Technic is a way of making sense and making order of your perceptions and of reality based on one important idea. We are endowed with language. It is through language that we make sense of the world. If I was not able to nominate, to denominate different things and, and with, this word, with my words to separate them, I would, I would have no world to live in. I create my landscape by giving different names. Think of Adam in the Garden of Eden. God says, go and give the name to all the animals, they're all for you. This idea of creating through words. Technic says, well, Everything that exists, so all the things that we accept as legitimately there, are things that can be captured by a linguistic definition. This linguistic definition doesn't have to be only with normal language, Mustafa, human, table, but it can also be uh, financial language, IT language, scientific language, the language of citizenship, and so on and so forth. So everything that exists is capturable by language. The, the second part of this idea, as a criterion of organizing, is all the things that cannot be captured by language, all the things that resist the capture of language, and if you think about it, you realize that there are already a few that might come immediately to mind, but then I'll focus into one in a moment. Those things don't exist. Ultimately, the real criterion to decide what exists in reality is language, and the real stuff of which things are made is language. When you look at, at this object, you list the list of things of which it is composed. Its molecular composition, its weight, its cost, its history. These are all linguistic definitions. 
when you are exhaust, when you have exhausted the list of linguistic qualities that belong to this object, the object is done. Fundamentally, the object is the list of its qualities, linguistically arranged. Magic is a very different way of creating reality. For magic, the idea is that when you look around yourself, when you encounter something that exists, you, but also when I look at myself and I realize that I exist, that thing which I am looking at is not Mustafa, is not a male, is not any of your particular qualities, but it is the fact that you exist. The most important thing about you and about me is the fact that we exist. Then the other qualities can change. The other qualities can be uh, rearranged in many different ways, depend on culture, circumstances, and so on. But existence is the most important thing. So if I have to organize my perceptions about you, I don't organize them by using language as a criterion. I organize them by using the intuition that you exist as the basis. And I say the intuition because existence, pure existence, is beyond language. It is ineffable. It is the thing that you cannot explain through any other linguistic mean. If you use that as the beginning of your way of ordering reality, you create a very different world. In the book, I look at the world of technique and the world of magic. I look at them um, looking at the different dimensions that they create, literally the architecture of the world, and they are one the opposite of the other. They are the mirror of each other. And in that sense, I also use that uh, accounting system to, to create an order in their descriptions. Your starting point is a kind of nervous breakdown. It's, everything has just stopped. It's not working anymore, and we just have to hit the pause button on everything and reassess everything, and that's what you map out. Um, why things have just stopped, why things have just broken down, and what we can do, what we can do about it. it not in a literal sense, go out and protest. Um, but, and this is very much, this is your kind of analysis, and you know, I sense it's from your kind of anarchist background, which is about analyzing systems and structures and trying to kind of destabilize them or work around them. We want a society in which we just play every day, we're just free, we don't have the, the just horrendous torture of meaningless labor, you know? Uh, um, that's, that's, that's how I sense where you're coming from. Is that a fair assessment? It is fair, but I think, strangely, um, my desire to kind of always go to the fundamental level and shift the terrain completely, to not engage dialectically with the world as it is, but to kind of like turn the table upside down it doesn't come so much from anarchism or my anarchist uh, readings, but more from my readings in military strategy and military history. Wow. <laughs> yeah. In authors um, like Maurice, the Byzantine emperor, and, um, but also Sun Tzu, von Clausewitz, the, the old writers of the, of the past, like the military strategists of the past, the ones that wrote books of um, military methodology. One of the things that you find recurrently is that by choosing the terrain of the confrontation, you are already, to a large extent, deciding the outcome of the confrontation. If you enter a terrain that was not chosen by you, but it was chosen by your adversary, specifically because it gives them a great advantage, then it is much more difficult, sometimes impossible, for you to win. And I noticed by looking at the political developments of the past few decades, that the, the left, and the extreme left and hard left, um, to which I belong in part as an anarchist, uh, made the mistake of entering terrains that were already predefined. And in those terrains, it seemed impossible. I think it's, it makes sense to wonder to what extent it's possible to connect metaphysical investigations with political, uh, with a political, not agenda, but also political interests, and whether the two have anything in common. I believe they do. I believe that there is before the political sphere, there is a pre-political sphere where you set up all the ingredients that you need, all the, the game board where the political game takes place. Depending on how you set it up, you make different political games possible. The ultimate terrain, the ultimate pre-political layer where you decide in advance what are the moves that are possible on top is metaphysics, how you structure the world, for example. When we think about the problem of migrations, 
If I say the think of the problem of migrations, you immediately understand what I mean, as if it was a real thing. Hmm? If I was talking about the problem of ghosts, you would be like, what are you talking about? We, you immediately understand what I mean, because we are given the idea that there are some natural things in the world. States, nations, boundaries, the citizenships, identities, all these things are natural. This, after all, is England. England is not a ghost. England is not an abstraction. England is a real thing. And there are people that are not from England, but they are from another part, and they don't have, or they have different identities and so on, and we regulate their movements. So if we enter the debate on migration by already accepting that nations and borders are truly metaphysically, eh, metaphysically existing things that truly define metaphysically important aspects of people to the point of defining what they are, then we've already lost. Okay? Then it's impossible to really take this off the hinges and really modify migration policies. However, on, on the contrary, if we enter by saying, hold on a second, do we accept that this thing is metaphysically real? Or is it a fantasy? In the way that, for example, we have discarded previously uh, accepted metaphysical ideas, like the soul, like ghosts, like spirits, like uh, bad omens, uh, lucky and unlucky days, you know, all these kind of things, destiny. We don't believe that those things existed, or God's plan. We now take, we don't take them as existing objects. We, we have marginalized them from reality. I think it might be time to start swapping completely the terrain metaphysically, be, just below the level of our politics. One thing that uh, uh, fascinated me in your, in your book and in your explanations that I've heard you talk about and which I think is relevant to this show is the way in which um, artists are producers of welding, concepts of welding. It's a, it's a, it's a word you, you borrow from Heidegger, I understand. Um, but it's, you also use the phrase cosmogonic, which I find really... <laughs> I've never heard that word before I started reading your um, texts. And it's a, I interpret it as a, a, a horizon, a field of view, a, field, a, a horizontal view of the world. Um, can you explain a little bit more when you talk about welding and cosmogonic? Mm. Well, cosmogony is an old Greek term. I think maybe nowadays there is more familiarity with the word cosmology. A cosmology is the picture of the universe. So, for example, um, you have a particular cosmology when you have an idea of how the universe, reality, is fundamentally structured. Different civilizations have had different cosmologies. Every civilization has a cosmology of its own, how the universe is structured and they present it either through their mythology or their science. Then, of course, there is always the fundamental question. If reality is structured in this way, who did it? How did it happen that, it, that suddenly there was something rather than nothing? And how did it happen that this something was structured in this particular way? And that's where you find cosmogonies. Cosmogonies are usually mythological accounts uh, of how the cosmos came to be. The goni at the end has to do with generation. Also in generation there is the same root. Uh, in Greek also gune, woman, has the same root. So it's the idea of like bringing something into, into uh, to life. So a cosmogony is the moment in which a world comes into being. In mythologies, of course, this is usually assigned to a particular mythological character, the creator god or a creator force that brought about a particular book, a particular, a particular world. In science also there are some phenomena or some moments that are seen as uh, the beginning of the universe. The Big Bang is the cosmogonic moment of the scientific universe. In what I was exp exp exploring with my book, I, I started from a different hypothesis. That what we call the world is very much the product of our ordering, of our raw perceptions, on a plane that has no order whatsoever, what you call chaos. This is, by the way, similar to typical cosmogonies. What creates a world? The answer is fundamentally the one that make, does the job of perceiving and ordering it, which might mean specifically you yourself. If you yourself are the one that operates this, then you are the cosmogonic force, the force that creates a cosmos out of chaos. 
there's a couple of things to keep in mind when talking about this. One has to do with the freedom of cosmogony, and one has to do with the limitations of cosmogony. Let's begin with the limitations of cosmogony. Every single one of us can create the world very differently, depending on uh, how they decide to put things together. Um, we can decide that when we, uh, when we receive, for example, the, the, the perceptions and impressions of this room, I decide not to separate between you and the chair, but you and the chair constitute one object. You and the shirt constitute one object. Or I can decide to separate your head from the rest of your body and create it into two, and so on and so forth. I can assign different names, creating a different catalog of what there is. I can assign a name to your aura, or to your soul, or to the dream of my grandmother last night, and make them populate my world. I can imagine that time goes cyclically, and so on and so forth. So there is infinite freedom. This infinite freedom, however, you know, when we look at how we interact with each other, is partly disproved. Because when we say we meet at 1.30, we assume that we're going to meet at 1.30. When I address you as Mustafa and you address me as Federico, we assume that we share the same way of making that world. This is because in order to interact with each other, we do need to find some common ground. Each of us can create the world entirely differently. None of them is true or false, or more true or more false. But in order to be able to have a conversation, to share some common ground, we need to synchronize. Synchronize the way in which we create objects out of perceptions, time, and so on. Civilizations usually provide this. Civilizations are big metronomes for worlding. They keep the time, and you can synchronize yourself to it, and then we start deciding that, for example, since we live in London in the 21st century, we recognize, we both of us accept as a working hypothesis that the soul doesn't exist, ghosts don't exist, matter is real, uh, five pound notes actually correspond to something existing, a passport corresponds to something real, time flows one minute at the time, and so on, regularly. These are arbitrary hypotheses, but they are somehow created um, uh, by these metronomes that we have to adopt to find some common ground. So the way in which we create the world is influenced by these metronomes. That said, nonetheless, every time we decide how to order reality for ourselves, fundamentally we always remain free to change it. Fundamentally, the cosmogonic act is always entirely arbitrary, always entirely free. The cosmogonic act, the one of making order out of chaos, is the first aesthetic act. If you think about it, when you try to judge your actions, you judge them on the basis of certain parameters, for example, ethical parameters. Am I doing a good action or a bad action? Is this thing right or wrong? or logical parameters. Is this thing correct or incorrect? Does it make sense or not? All these philosophical machines, logic, ethics, and so on, are specific of the idea you have of the world. Logic operates differently depending on how the world is structured. Ethics operates differently depending how the world is structured. Typical example, no? If, if we decide that the world is made of living and non-living beings, then ethically there is no problem destroying non-living beings. If, like the Yanomami uh, people in the Amazon forest, we decide that the whole world is alive, then it's an ethical problem to break a piece of, a piece of rock. Now, all these different things so depend on the, on the shape of the world. So fundamentally, they all depend on how you make the world. The way in which you make the world is aesthetics. When you operate aesthetically, you are at the very ground zero. You cannot look any back at anything else already there to decide how to do it. Your decision is arbitrary. And in so doing, you set the foundations for logics, for ethics, for everything else. So there is always this fundamental freedom to change the way in which you make world, to change the cosmology. After all, there is always a hint of omnipotence in the stories about the creator God. Tell us what growing up in Sicily um, means for you and how you perceive the world and through that experience in terms of your philosophical practice? 
Well, I, I grew up around Italy because one of the typical things of, the, of Mediterranean people since the beginning of time and especially nowadays is migrating. And my parents moved from Sicily to the north and then we moved back again. And so it was a continuous movement. For me, Sicily was the homeland in a sense. It was never fully mine because as the child of migrants, I was connected to it, but at the same time, I was also separate from it. Of course, the, the, the Mediterranean engulfs the whole of Italy, so the whole of Italy is Mediterranean, but there is something quite unique about Sicily. Let's say the quintessence of the Mediterranean in Italy can be found more in the south than in the north. The Mediterranean, as you say, is a strange area. In itself, for example, it means that which is between the lands. Uh, but originally, in, uh, for example, in Latin, when you would say this, uh, an area was Mediterranean, you wouldn't mean the Mediterranean Sea. You would mean, for example, the area of Gaul, France, that was between two other lands. It was, is the place in between. Then it was applied to the Mediterranean a bit later on. The Mediterranean is something that, to a tourist, seems very clearly one specific thing. To a tourist, Mediterranean is that specific uh, sun, the sunlight, that specific color, that specific uh, habits, the, the specific blue of the sea. When you look into it, actually, it's not like that. The Mediterranean is, paradoxically, none of the things that um, we usually associate with it. Let's begin with the color. The Mediterranean is clearly blue. Well, and not. To the, for the ancient Egyptians, the Mediterranean was green. It was called the Great Green. For the Greeks at the time of Homer, was the color of wine. For the Turks, is the White Sea. For us, is the Blue Mediterranean. Already just at the basic facts, if you start looking historically, you see that it shifts. The taste of the Mediterranean, the, um, the tomatoes, the um, chili peppers, the aubergines, none of it comes from the Mediterranean. They come from as far as China and the Americas, and so on and so forth. There is something quite unique, however, to the Mediterranean, which is specifically Mediterranean. A couple of things. One is that being a sea between the lands, it has always been traversed by people. The interesting aspect that you say, like, I come from further southeast, and yet I look more as if I was a northerner, and, I, I, and vice versa in my case. The people of the Mediterranean have moved all the time. And so it's impossible, really, to define a Mediterranean ethnicity as such really doesn't exist. So the, the way in which they have mixed ethnically has also contributed to, the, to the, their mixing culturally. The languages of the Mediterranean constantly influence each other. The, way, the habits, the way of living, the religions are constantly influencing each other. So one thing that is typical in Mediterranean is well, what we could call syncretism, so different identities merging into a new monstrous being. The Mediterranean is a monstrous being. It's impossible to locate except in any way. And this is something that has influenced me, of course, because it gives you an idea that the things that appear stable maybe to other perspectives, stable civilizations, stable cultures, uh, stable values and identities, from a Mediterranean perspective, are not stable at all. They, even their origin is always impure. That's one thing. The other thing that is typical, I think, of the Mediterranean is the fact that it has been the cradle of civilizations in the sense that it has witnessed the birth of many different civilizations. But most importantly, it's been the graveyard of civilizations. All the things that make up the Mediterranean, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Mesopotamians a little bit further away, the ancient Egyptians, the Italian Renaissance, all these things, they all have died. And there is a sense in the Mediterranean of death, a familiarity with death, which I think is quite unique. The idea there, and in, the, in, in Sicilian um, folk stories and folk music, this is very present. The fact that nothing is permanent, that even the greatest achievement doesn't have an infinite future ahead of itself. That the future is finite. That every single bubble has a future that goes to a certain point and then it ends. That time is not a line, but it's a segment. You find syncretism in Latin America, you find syncretism in, in uh, East Asia, 
But I think in the Mediterranean, the process of syncretism has been relentless for such a long time that truly constitutes one of the real characters. Syncretism is a method, and it's a method that is very forgotten nowadays. When we think about how differences can go together, nowadays we think that one option is that they stay next to each other, like a mosaic. Another option is that they merge into one thing, clearly. One swallows the other. You know, integration, in terms of immigration, usually that's what it's called. You are an immigrant to France, you become French. Syncretism means that every single part of it is betrayed in the union with the others, and you create something entirely new and unplaceable. The second aspect of the Mediterranean that I think is important is the fact that there has been so much syncretism, also because all the different groups that have inhabited it, all the different societies that inhabited the Mediterranean, died at some point. Every native was displaced. There is, for example, the, the Mediterranean hardly has any true natives in the way in which we fantasize about this term. My family is Sicilian. In Sicily, we haven't had natives since, I think, the 5th century BC. All the rest, all the Sicilian people are Greek, Albanian, Romans, uh, Celts, Arabs, and so on and so forth. This is because Everything that was constructed at some point, any particular uh, society, culture, identity, at some point disintegrated and died, and a new one came up, mixed with the others. So the, the familiarity of this Mediterranean people, and I think in particular of the Sicilian people, with this process explains also that familiarity with death. Sicilian folk songs, for example, often have to do with death sung in a happy way, usually. There's tales of skulls on top of the cannon speaking to the, to the people passing by. For a philosopher, I think this is important because the familiarity with death is a metaphysical insight. I was saying earlier that when we, when we look around ourselves and we make order in our perceptions, we construct worlds. That these worlds can be done in different ways. Different civilizations order things differently. In the Mediterranean, every time they have tried one particular way, every time there has been one civilization, and there have been many, it's been defined as a cradle of civilizations, they've always inevitably died. And every time that idea of reality, what they thought was nature, was clearly, obviously, nature, what really there is, unquestionably, not only was questioned, but it was supplanted by something else. Metaphysically, this allows you to understand that there is nothing stable at that level, that there, are no, there is no nature. This is a, an old idea, ecology without nature, that it's possible to have an ecological understanding, which is also metaphysical, without the idea of something natural and stable already there. That time itself does not flow like a line infinitely, but continues only like a segment, that the fu even the future of a civilization ends, and what begins afterwards is something entirely different, is another time segment. This familiarity with death also has influenced me a lot because it made me understand that some of the things that we give for granted as natural, infinitely, automatically stretching forward, they don't. They really depend on certain conditions to survive. And then they end. And one of these things is time. And one of these things is reality also. So I think the Mediterranean is a great school uh, in that sense. It's a great school politically, for example, for the question of migrations. And it's a, it's a great school culturally, understanding the, the, the nuance of what you're doing when you are moving forward culturally, socially or ethically. You are moving forward to a certain point, but there is no line.